Okay, so I'd like to thank the uh, folks that put this talk together today because the first two speakers did a lot of my work for me. What we learned is that uh, possible damage to our water supply is a function of our city council's behavior, county council's <laughs> behavior, and um, we know that overeating not only causes diabetes and other terrible things, but it also may cause Alzheimer's. So I'm, I didn't know that, so we might need to talk before long. <laughs> So my mom died of Alzheimer's, and I think it was either that or multiple strokes. And it's not clear because she didn't have the final diagnosis. So anyway, uh, the um, purpose of this talk is to try to frame some of the work that we're doing in behavioral science and public health. And I put this slide up partly because I got the Al Johnson Award in 1994, I think. I didn't go back and actually check that, so I have a 1995 estimate here. This is from a Google, pardon me, a Google search on the world population going forward from 1950. Um, and you can see coming up to 2050, which for some of you will be just an eye-blink, and for, for some of us we may not make it that far. And we, we reach almost 10 million, pardon me, 10 billion people. And that change is slowing down by decades, but it is still going up. And uh, for those of you who know, the carrying capacity of the globe is probably somewhere around two to three billion. And that might be off by a billion or two, but it's clearly not going to be 10 plus. And so what I see here is that sex works, and we can question the overall effect of contraception, even if it works uh, for individuals. And that's important because that's probably the driving force for um, climate change and global warming which could result in uh, the extinction of all life. So, oh, sorry about that. Um, I can't say hello in 10 minutes, and I can't walk around and talk, and can't talk without walking around. So anyway, I, I have asserted that probably 75% of the variance in morbidity, premature mortality, and quality of life is attributable to behavior, not necessarily the individual's behavior that is acquiring a disease, but possibly other people around them that may be helping cause it. So CVS has become a health producing company now with the elimination of tobacco. Uh, it needs to eliminate other things to become a more thorough health agency, but it is. And so clearly people that sell tobacco and people that sell Pepsi and other things are contributing to the damage of others who consume them. And so in this case, uh, we see that there are many forms of morbidity and premature mortality sources, such as infectious diseases, chronic diseases, traumatic injury, and war, which produces all of the above in one way or another. And in most wars, infectious diseases and sometimes some chronic diseases uh, actually take more casualties than the battles do. And global warming causes morbidity and premature mortality. And global warming might destroy all life, and global warming is caused by human behavior. And so far as I can tell, in the recent treaties that we've had, nobody's mentioned human behavior. They mentioned it as if it was a weather problem. And I'm, I agree, it's a weather problem. It's just not related to that. Now, the director of the behavioral science program at NIH is Bill Riley. Bill Riley is a really cool guy. I think he got the job by going covert. So he has been working on a number of dynamic models and other studies to increase the use of mobile technology and real-time measures of behavior and ultimately real-time interventions to alter behavior of individuals and possibly of groups. And uh, in his work, one of his papers, he has looked at some of the popular theories in psychology today and argues that they do not inform the technology. He also argues that the technology does not inform those same psychological theories. I'm not nearly as famous as he, nor nearly as bright as he, but I have asserted, <laughs> not yet published, principles of behavior will inform real-time measures, and we're doing it, and the real-time interventions that we're creating will also inform a better understanding of the effects of the combination, uh, and interventions will eventually um, make a difference in our program ability to actually change behavior. So, let's see if this will work. We have been studying secondhand smoke exposure for a long time. I don't know where that came from. 
Well, we're going to go elsewhere now. Let's see if I can get back to it. Um, so this lady's actually uh, famous. She was put in a slideshow that I had permission for educational purposes for, for a local educational purpose. And then somebody in the room uh, managed to capture a slide and it went viral all over the world. So we have violated an IRB here by her picture going viral. So I only present her now since the damage is already done. The, the work that we've done with her and with others like her is really to look at um, behavioral science and see if we can use contingencies of reinforcement to um, mimic the biological and the physics, chemistry, and biological foundations of, of our diseases and our morbidity sources. And we've been pretty successful in that so far. Well, so the contingencies, this is a simple model. Doctors explain cotinine, which is a biomarker of nicotine, and that this is apparent might establish a home smoking ban, and that at some later date, a feedback mechanism from the cotinine assessment in the doctor's office could be used to uh, provide this woman with the uh, knowledge that she's doing a good job in home bans. That's a simple contingency. Each one of those is a contingency where the A, B, C, and the yellow, red, and C is an antecedent behavior consequence sequence. Those are the simplest rules of a contingency system. Here's a complicated one. This is dissecting social networks. Asthmatic child in the middle of this scene um, is pressured by others to start smoking, including a friend, a sister. The doctor advises never to smoke. A father smokes, mother smokes, and an uncle hates it but still smokes. We don't know what's going to happen to this young girl with asthma and smoking. We, sh we probably can guess she's going to be damaged by the secondhand exposure of this group in any case. And this raises an issue. When somebody has social support, it means people care for you. It doesn't mean they aren't killing you <laughs> or changing your behavior. And so we would like to dissect social support and social networks and then look at those interactions that are uh, enhancing behavior and those that are not. The same thing is true with large systems, such as legis legislative systems, policy making, and regulation. And the FDA now is about to march into the tobacco industry in a big way. The science now going on, some of it here, um, is going to give them basis for curtailing the industry's um, product of tobacco. So if they take filters off, if they try to take some of the toxins out, it's going to damage their ability to make money on those same things. Now, in this case, I've used the medical professions here because there are all kinds of legislative policies that guide all these clinicians and manage their behavior in various ways. The current Affordable, Air, Air Act, uh, current Affordable Care Act has penalties for doctors. The penalties are based on the patient not complying. That means that they're going to be a train wreck down, downstream because you can't fire all the doctors and have any doctors left, and they don't know how to do anything with people in their home, in the community, or at work. So this is going to be where we can come in and actually extend that. So since I'm running late, I'm going to skip through these and go to this. So this is a study that was done by Mark Adams here for uh, his postdoc. And the work we're doing here is using accelerometers for real-time measures of physical activity and uh, the number of steps that women could get in an, ex in an experiment that we were doing. This is comparing a, a steady state system to an adaptive model. So you can see in this adaptive model, this woman came up to a steady state of about 10,000 or a little bit more than 10,000 steps. That's what we were looking for. Whereas this one's is about eight and very variable. This one over here is also in the same adaptive model. And this one is in the static. And you can see this one's down around maybe five or six. <clears throat> At the middle of that D graph there, you see a drop near to zero. This lady got the flu. And the nature of this percentile schedule of a reward that we had her on, unlike this one where there were a few drops and then jumped back. But in that one, she had to be reshaped back up, but it worked. And so I view that case as doing what the theory says it should do. It brought her back up to the goal level, or nearly, in the time that this study was going on. So we have evidence that we can create an auto-shaping program to change behavior and possibly sustain it. Now we're doing the same thing with the dilos that just flashed by you, and this is a graph of the data that we're getting right now. All of this is baseline, and one of these dilos is in 
Um, my wife is an optometrist, and she's convinced me that I'm not colorblind. I'm color stupid. <laughs> so this is, I think, purple, and I think this is pink. And one of those is a monitor in the baby's room, and one of those is a monitor in the smoking area. And this area out here is where we give feedback in real time to the families that are in our study right now. And it is reducing the magnitude and frequency of smoking in the home in a non-specific fashion. So I put this up so that you can get some humor. On the top slide, you can see a TV and a treadmill. The TV is winning, except for the dog. And down here, you can see an implicit engineering of a park and uh, availability for walking and probably other sports and maybe even in the winter, which might become important even in San Diego. That's it. <laughs> Questions for Dr. Howell? I have that effect on my students, too. <laughs> <laughs> Bill? So, so we're, we're trying to measure third hand smoke, and uh, any particular form is more reliable. Uh, different forms of codeine and nicotine uh, ratios of different form uh, is more important than others, or, or what surfaces and how long it's been there. So, um, other than the measures you may be helping us to develop right now, which may be more precise. Um, the ones that we have now are really, uh, in my view, a constellation. So we have reported information about smoking, about exposure to smoke. And we have, um, in this case, a dialogue subjective measure where we can count particles that are predominantly from combustion products and smoke. And since in a smoking home, that's usually mostly smoking, especially in certain times of the day and so forth. Then we have nicotine, which is an environmental marker. And then we have cotinine, which is a biological marker. And there are a couple of other biological and even environmental markers. But we're basically using the constellation to sneak up on the dynamics of what's going on where people are exposed to smoke. And it works pretty well, and it's collective. But I don't view any one of the measures we currently have access to to be entirely sufficient. So even the particle counts are not specific to cigarette smoke and that we can't wear them yet. So if you can build one that we can wear, then we can get your exposure. Mm -hmm. Right now we're getting whoever's in the home. So it's really another environmental marker from which we can infer something about smoking and therefore the exposure to other people. I'm wondering how you could extrapolate this to climate change. Um, there's something visceral that with smoking, people know it's really bad. They can see it. They can smell it. It's in the house. You can measure it. Right. Climate change seems more existential in a way. And so what lessons can you draw about behavior modifications in, in, in the realm of climate change, which you mentioned in your talk? I did. Yes. Um, first of all, that's a very good question, and it's a very complicated answer. I'm only going to be able to do a shallow version. First is that there are all kinds of public systems where you can provide people feedback. And this has been done during droughts. When I was at Stanford, we had a big drought in Palo Alto area. And Palo Alto doesn't have water meters. And even then, they were relatively well off financially. And so it was hard to see how we could get them to not use water. And we had a severe cut everywhere else in the Bay Area, but not in Palo Alto. So they did a, a newspaper campaign. And they basically appealed to their, partly their educational backgrounds that were quite high and said, this is what's going to happen to our environment if we don't protect it. And that worked. And we got about a 33% decrease in water use. You can also do like thermometers and put it on city lawns and put it on building lawns and all around and show the public feedback about what's going on with the control of water use or other kinds of utilities. And that can be shown to work. It helps if there's some systems of reward in it or sometimes penalties. And most regulatory agencies use penalties. In fact, I hardly know of any that have ever rewarded anybody for anything. So it's, it's overwhelmingly penalties. Um, we think we can do that also by other means. I mean, I have solar on my roof, and I'm driving an electric car now, and I don't have any costs. I was supposed to amortize my solar in eight years. I think I'll do it in four. 
And, uh, you know, getting that information out in quantitative and qualitative ways to individuals that have no experience with it will change their opinion of some of the technology that they're employing. Thank you. So, uh, first, let's thank all three of our speakers. <laughs>